Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our latest real-time session with Jörn de Boer. Uh, I'll introduce him in a moment, and I have uh, a great colleague, and I've had the honor of knowing and, and watching his work for many years. Uh, we continue to have a few. We only have two more scheduled, so if you're interested in a topic or you think we should continue these, please let me know, um, and we will we'll continue that. Uh, we have on Tuesday, I'll put out an announcement momentarily, we have Sari Feldman and her team, uh, she's now retired, but her team from the Cuyahoga County Public Library talking about advocacy, uh, which should be a pretty impressive session. So that'll be on Tuesday morning. And then on Thursday, Marie Osterland, director at the Aarhus Public Library in Denmark, which is quite frankly the, I, I know politically, I'm supposed to say one of the, but as far as I'm concerned, the uh, innovative library uh, in the world, uh, doing some amazing work on the library's movement. And so that's going to be a, a fun and fascinating conversation. Uh, today we are recording this, and the recording uh, and archive will be up hopefully by the end of the day, tomorrow at the latest. So please invite folks to share and participate. So today we have Jörn de Boer. Um, who is an innovation advisor at FOS, um, which is a service provider in the Netherlands, uh, primarily involved in digital literacy, including uh, as project leader of the Frisk Lab and the Data Detox Project. I know we're going to hear about Data Detox today. I'm looking forward to that. A freelancer who writes for a number of professional magazines for information professionals and a passionate musician and drummer and an avid amateur cyclist. And we were just joking that um, an amateur cyclist in the Netherlands is pretty much considered an Olympia, Olympic style performer here in the United States, uh, where we have cycles that don't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, let's see, a uh, strong interest in open copyright, online privacy, the public domain and library innovation, always looking for new insights. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reading this off of his website and I love the fact that he makes sure that he puts that he's a lover of specialty beers. Uh, and um, in 2015, gave a TED Talks entitled The Library uh, as Maker and Information Space. In 2015, also nominated for the Best Librarian in the Netherlands. In the summer of 2015, he was busy. You were busy in 2015. Wrote a book published. Yeah. Uh, they wrote together with American colleague Terry Willingham on maker spaces in libraries. A follow-up to this appeared in 2017, Library Makerspaces, The Complete Guide. And he wrote a, an article about the impact through Connection Project in School Library Makerspaces in Action here in 2018. And so when he takes a break and um, breathes, uh, luckily he's able to join us. So good morning, or I guess good afternoon for you, sir. Good morning, David. Good to be here. Uh, so, um, can you just give us a little sense from your perspective, what's the sort of current state and thinking about libraries during this pandemic over in the Netherlands? Um, I think after a couple of days of thinking about, okay, what on earth are we going to do right now? Um, a lot of uh, initiatives uh, started. Um, there are quite some libraries who have uh, a lending program so people can go to the library uh, in a safe manner uh, um, to pick up uh, books they have, they have uh, uh, asked for uh, at, a, at, a, at a library. So writing out a form on the website um, and then the books are selected, put in, a, put in a little basket and you can come to the library uh, at a certain time. Uh, and pick up your books, uh, which is a server that is really highly uh, regarded by, by the library patrons. Um, so that's going on. Uh, at the same time, uh, the National Library of the Netherlands uh, made sure that a lot of uh, uh, digital content is available for free. Um, it's called Thuisbeep or Home Library uh, uh, in English. Um, and you, you can download uh, ebooks uh, for free uh, on your e-reader and uh, enjoy reading uh, in this time. Um, um, uh, and combined with that, uh, quite some uh, online offerings, uh, ranging from, for instance, uh, uh, instruction videos on how to make or build, uh, build things, so that that's more in the library lab environment. Uh, um, that's happening in quite some libraries uh, all over the country. Um, and there's uh, a national 
uh, a forum uh, also hosted by the National Library. It's called Crisis Library or Crisis Beep, uh, in which all of these um, uh, uh, ideas and, in, and initiatives are uh, shared. Um, so anyone can, can, can learn from what, 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 what any other library or librarian is doing. Um, uh, so that's, that there's actually a, a lot happening uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's really great to see that the public is reacting to that um, very positively. So um, the library is seen as an institution that's, that's adapting quite well to this uh, situation. Um, it's, I, think, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, never waste a good crisis. Uh, I think libraries in the Netherlands are, are really taking this time as, as, as an, an advantage to, to uh, try out new things um, and, and try to circulate um, and, and promote the things that they were already doing quite well. Yeah, nice. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. So um, you have been busy and you've been talking about different ways. Uh, and, and when we put this together, the idea was not just, it was actually less of, okay, what are we doing during the crisis and more about what happens when we open the doors again? Uh, what happens when, when we sort of, what is the new normal? What should it look like? And I know you've been doing a lot of thinking around that area um, and you've been talking, uh, I'm very interested, for example, in digital detox and talking a lot about awareness that um, as people are moving currently, but certainly we've been moving for, for years and years and years more towards digital online services, more towards building communities, but building communities online, um, it's a different environment to build, right? That, that, that when people come to the library, in many cases, they're coming as a place to be that, that values privacy, that allows them to sort of be together and not necessarily worry about who's watching, et cetera. But when mm -hmm. you go to have that kind of community actions and engage in different things online, it's a very different world. And if we're not cognizant of it, if we don't pay attention to that, we are gonna get ourselves in issues. And so I know that privacy is a, is a really strong issue for you. So at this point, let me just turn it over and and, and Let's hear, what should we be thinking about? Um, well, it's, it's exactly right uh, uh, um, what you're saying. Um, more and more, we, we, we are not only uh, uh, doing things online, but we, we more and more also depend on, on online services. Um, when it comes to, to the Netherlands, my home country, um, the national government it is, is actually requiring uh, uh, Dutch citizens to 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 manage uh, uh, a lot of their their personal uh, services online. Um, so um, on the one hand, this means that people have to adapt to that, um, which already can be quite hard and difficult for uh, especially for. Uh, for people who aren't that highly skilled uh, uh, um, in the first place when it comes to, to digital services. Um, but apart from that, there is this uh, um, higher level of awareness, so to say, and then you talk about things like digital privacy. Okay, if you, if, if you, if you know how a web browser works or a certain application works, that's one thing. Uh, but are you aware of uh, the company or institution that build it? Um, uh, do you know what their uh, interests are? Um, um, that's, that, that's already something that can be quite difficult for a lot of people because it's, it's something that, that's not tangible. Um, um, and then comes the hard part. Um, what can I do myself? to to master the skills um, and make smart decisions um, uh, you know when you talk about technology technology in itself uh, um, is based on human decisions someone decided to write code someone decided to build in a web tracker in a web browser um, uh, you know th those are human decisions um, it are also human decisions to decide if you want this tracker in your web browser or in this video chatting uh, uh, application. Um, 
So it's technology nowadays um, is about people. Um, you know, we are we are using this technology. We are forced to use this technology. Um, but when it comes to mastering the technology, um, um, and you're dealing, for instance, with software that's open source, um, uh, there's not so much you can do, um, especially when you don't know what other options or alternatives are. Um, so this is already a quite quite a difficult and abstract uh, abstract thing to uh, to craft, uh, especially for for young people, for elderly people, uh, for people in general who aren't highly skilled when it comes to digital technologies. Um, so when I came across um, the Data Detox project, which is a project that is developed by an, a Berlin-based NGO called Technical Technology. Uh, I thought this is something that libraries should promote. So I will show you some slides for, uh, uh, I think explaining what the project is about. Um, and I will also talk a little bit about the ways that we uh, uh, talk about the projects we did building uh, on this data detox project. Excellent. So I will share my screen, and I hope <laughs> it will work. Um, yeah, so um, uh, the Data Details Project, uh, it's, it's a project that is initiated by, by, by the Technical Technology Collective um, in Berlin. Um, uh, and something that we at first, together with the libraries in our network, the Fusion Library Network, uh, made into a project um, that, that became our own. Um, and basically, this project is about working on your new digital personality. Um, and you do that in a number of steps, uh, uh, eight steps, so to say. Um, starting with uh, um, uh, doing, doing a quick a check up on, on, on what your current uh, situations when it comes to digital, uh, uh, digital privacy, then going into um, uh, certain aspects of online behavior, so using social networks, uh, searching online, uh, knowing about your mobile phone, and how it works, uh, uh, knowing about the number of apps that you have installed on your uh, uh, phone or, or tablet, and that you don't need all of them because every app that you use uh, is an extra way which you uh, share data with uh, entities, both known and unknown. Um, learning about, for instance, how to make uh, a good password or better, or, or, or better yet, a passphrase. Um, then combining that in the final steps to come up with a new digital personality. Uh, which is not really about being a better person, uh, or that would be nice, of course, <laughs> but um, uh, being uh, uh, an online user that is aware of what's happening when it, when it comes to the sharing of data in your digital privacy, uh, uh, being able to make small decisions, um, and also being able to uh, um, uh, do uh, go through this pro uh, process for for a number of times, um, but then knowing how it works and uh, making it something that's coming normal for me to do. Um, so the um, detox kit uh, it comes in, in a paid version. Um, we also set up a website uh, at uh, uh, dash detox. Uh, which is a Dutch website, uh, but the national version, the national version is at datadetox.org. Um, there you can also find two data detox kits um, and also a version for, uh, uh, for youngsters, um, which is quite nice. Um, so that's um, the project in general. And 
What we did um, at SAS is that we set from the start when we translated the original kit touch, um, that we were aware that the kit as it was, was mainly at people who already aware of the issues uh, and just needed some extra advice, some extra motivation uh, to work on their privacy. Um, at that time, there wasn't a detox kit for young people. There wasn't a detox kit for uh, literate people. Uh, so we said we start with this project, uh, but we also want to work on versions for those communities. Um, and when it comes to children, we came up with the Detox Kit project, which is funded by the National Library and we cooperate um, with the Bill Public Library and a local welfare organization. Um, and it's an ongoing project, it's happening now with a deadline uh, uh, at the end of this year. And we asked uh, a, a small group of uh, teens, uh, in a village in Friesland province where I work. Do you think is the best way to make this topic of digital privacy um, discussable with your peers? Um, because you know, give, uh, handing out a digital kit is, but it starts with being aware that this is something that is important to think about. Um, and hopefully also in a way that's fun and engaging. So went in, in the process with them, um, and they came up with a number of ways that they thought were interesting for their peers to make this topic of so privacy uh, a fun and important, uh, important to talk about. And they said, uh, depending on the budget that uh, we were uh, giving them, want this to be a play, just play or a theater or in a school or in a youth center. Um, and in this play, um, uh, uh, we want this topic of privacy to be uh, uh, the key part. Um, um, and let us work with uh, theater professionals um, to make this become a reality. Um, of course, in time of uh, uh, corona crisis, the uh, group of children and, and the teachers can't come together. They are doing online sessions right now to, to come up with scenes, to, to talk about the things that are interesting to them. Again, of course, social networks like TikTok or uh, Instagram or, or Snapped. Um, and then it's up to, to both the uh, participants and the professionals to come up, to come up with interesting uh, scenes and a story to make it into an actual play. Um, so that's, that's something that we are really proud of because children aren't doing this in a school set. They are motivated to do it outside of school. So. Um, We've come together, I think, five times uh, with a certain interval, I think, of two weeks in between all the time. Um, and they were spending uh, two to three hours every time to, to talk to each other, discuss things, get to know the kids, uh, uh, to know each other, because not all of them uh, knew each other. Um, so feeling safe, basically. Uh, being able to discuss this abstract topic. Um, so this, this, this project is ongoing. Um, uh, like I said, the deadline um, is at the end of this year, but I, I, I expect the script to be ready after the summer and the script will be shared with anyone who wants to do this play in a school or in a youth center or at any other place. Where it, where it could be relevant. Um, so it started with the Data Detox Kit, then we came up with Data Detox Kits. Um, and of course, anyone who is, um, uh, anyone who wants to work with this uh, uh, play uh, is invited to combine it again with the actual Data Detox Kit for children. 
um, which now uh, uh, developed by, by technical tech, and we will translate that to Dutch. Um, and the National Library in the Netherlands will make sure that it can be uh, uh, dis distributed to, to, to libraries or, or interested parties. Um, so that's, that's uh, a project that that's, uh, we are really proud of it, um, like I said, because this is something that, that is aimed at, at a group of people that can be vulnerable online. Um, and at the same time, we are uh, getting the message from this group of uh, this, this, this this small group of of participants um, that this could be the right way to approach this and to make this topic uh, um, discussable with uh, with peers. Um, earlier this year, we were invited by the National Library to come up with uh, a game that was uh, shared uh, nationwide during, uh, during the, the Dutch National Media Literacy Week, a uh, data detox game, um, uh, which is a fun way. It only lasts uh, a couple of minutes uh, to learn about cookies and safe passwords. Uh, uh, um, combined with uh, gaming, uh, gaming uh, um, uh, elements. Um, so we were doing quite some things for uh, uh, young people, but we're also doing things for uh, older people um, because that's a, that's a whole different uh, uh, a game, uh, so to say, because in that, in, in that sense, uh, you are talking about a group of people that is quite uh, uh, aware of their privacy, they value their privacy, but they are lacking a lot of time uh, the digital, still, uh, digital skills to, uh, to move around when it comes, for instance, uh, um, uh, to working with your, with your uh, computer or internet or uh, a tablet. Um, so I want, to screen, I want to switch to, to another screen um, to show you a short video um, uh, uh, that is about um, the concept that we came up with, which is uh, a game show, the smallest privacy show of the Netherlands, which is again a physical thing, so it's, it's not digital, a, a, a physical show that is about digital privacy. Um, but maybe David, you also want to uh um discuss with me uh, uh in the meantime um when it when it you know um uh, on, on the topic of what does what does this mean for uh, for young people because i i've talked about that uh now um what do you think well you know it's, it's interesting i think that that you take on and you've you've demonstrated one of the myths right the the myth of the digital native the idea that just because somehow somehow the age your age dictates your technical capability and i'm guessing what you found in this work is that that is certainly not true right right so i mean because the idea that and even you know i loved your phrase that that um first of all i love the phrase we are forced to use this technology uh, but that idea right because as governments are going online for taxes and all sorts of services, we are literally forced to use this technology. We don't have that option. Um, and so part of, I imagine what, what the digital detox does is it builds awareness, right? It changes people's perception so that it's not like they're solely focused on the task. They're now realizing that the tools to get and accomplish that task have costs, have things that you have to monitor, have things you understand. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that that that's happening right now, and I, I think it's very important that libraries play a role in that. That we that we you know we when, when you talk about um, uh, stimulating digital literacies uh, um, uh, in libraries, um, this topic of um, being able to choose. Uh, uh, what what application do I want to use? Uh, uh, do I know of different opportunities? Um, at what 
things uh, um, uh, are, are, are there are there certain certain um, elements of tool that I should focus on? Um, you know, uh, it's in general, it's about um, who I like to use this tool. It's about usability, um, which of course is very important. You know, you can have the the, the most privacy friendly tool there is, but if it's if it's too complex, people won't use it. Um, so it's it's always, or it seems that it is about that choice, uh, usability. Uh, versus uh, security or 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 or, or privacy. Um, in that sense, this time of the Corona crisis um, uh, can serve as an example that this is not something that should be the decision. You know, in the Netherlands, the last couple of weeks there was the initiative, the field initiative. At this time, we know that uh, to have a national app. Um, which could trace the spread of coronavirus. And the discussion uh, around that app, especially in the beginning, was what's more important for you, dear Dutch citizen, health or privacy? Um, and then so people were forced to take a stand, uh, um, choosing between two human rights. Um, and then uh, critics said that isn't the question. Privacy should not be in that equation. Mm. Privacy is mandatory. Uh, that should be integrated in any solution that you come up with. Um, the same goes for any tool that we are now more or less forced to use when it comes to video teaching or video lessons or video chatting. Um, there are tools, Zoom, for instance, um, that prove to be um, vulnerable when it comes to privacy. Um, there are other tools as well uh, that are that are very privacy friendly, but open source and small, uh, don't have the marketing power to to uh, reach a lot of people. And I think at that time, the library should serve those applications, that, that last segment of applications. OK, they are small, but they're good. Uh, um, they have built in uh, uh, human choices uh, um, that, uh, that care about who you are, uh, your, your digital privacy, uh, when it comes to privacy, of course. Um, uh, and I think people, people should be in the position um, that they can go to a library um, and can make an informed decision uh, on what tools to use, um, especially when it comes to important topics as, as, as such as uh, digital privacy and uh, security. Um, and not only um, the most common used uh, uh, tools that are around. Um, yeah. But, but it's a, so one, I, yeah. I, I really appreciate the the idea of that that uh, healthy versus privacy. You know that that uh, either we need to to track you and know everything about you, or it's privacy and everyone gets to die. It, it's a false conversation. It's a false choice. And yeah. I, I've actually was really refreshed. That's not the word. But I was I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that, for example, what Apple and Google were developing as potential ways of of tracking. And how it was actually built around privacy in it that they that there was a way to do this without having to necessarily identify exact people like they've done in uh, as opposed to what they've done in Israel and Taiwan and uh, South Korea and Iran, where you know it's all very much about sharing personal information and such. And, and what's scary to me is in the U.S. we have built the same kind of systems but they were built and offered by advertisers and sold back to governments because that data and that privacy set surveillance was already there. It's just two months ago it was trying to influence what we buy and who we vote for, and now it's being presented as our health. And we have to realize that, wait a minute, 
those were, you know, you realize what's happening here. This was beforehand. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to pick on, I wanted to, to, to explore something you said about making informed decisions. Um, and to use a medical analogy, right, that, that before you're supposed to, before you sort of give consent for a surgery or procedure or what have you, it's supposed to be informed consent. And I've always found that to be a bit, uh, I don't want to say ridiculous, but let's say it's a strange thing, right? That idea of, would you like to have this surgery? And by the way, we're going to do this. And I've only gone to medical school for four years and been practicing for 28 years and have all of this experience. But clearly you, as, as someone who teaches, know exactly what's about to happen and can make an informed decision. Um, I'm thinking back to the detox kit. I'm thinking to a lot of what we do with privacy. It seems like we're currently in a system that's set up to fail. That, that is, we, when we move into a system where each tool we use, each application, each web browser, each piece of physical technology owns their version of your data, right? That, that part of a green is that they own. It's a losing war because there's always, go, you know, you're never going to have a chance to read all the end user license agreement. You're never going to have a chance to read then the privacy update for every app. You're never going to, and then new apps emerging every 10 days and changing these things, right? It, if you use 10 apps, your full-time job could be sitting there and exploring the privacy applications and no one can get any work done doing that. So I, I'm, you know, I really appreciate the idea that things like the, the digital detox kit raise awareness of it, but it seems like we're going to need something more substantial and regulatory in its approach to say this, we, we need to work on a different model than thousands of copies of my personal data collected and owned and organized by thousands of organizations and move to something like, you know, uh, your, your, your data bank, um, God, sounds like a 1970s, but in other words, a secure place where you store your data and you then give permission to come in and access your data, um, not to own it, not to keep it, but to come in and get what you need and then leave. I mean, that kind of serious switch, I think, is something that, that we're, we need to contemplate. What are your think, thoughts about sort of that larger scale idea? I, I, I think that's, that, that's a very interesting thought. Um, uh, I indeed think um, um, when you look at this with um, uh, a negative view, um, uh, so you know we cannot win this war. Uh, um, uh, privacy doesn't exist anymore. I don't care about reading the privacy. Uh, 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 blah blah blah. Uh, when when I install an app, because they they already know every, uh, everything about me. Um, that's one way to look at it, and I think that it's also something that we have to um, work with. Uh, you know, when we when we when we have people visiting a library um, and ventilating those kind of emotions. Um, uh, um, you know, it's 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 hard. And you have you have to have a couple of arguments ready uh, um, to to uh, to go into this uh, discussion. Um, but I think far more interesting is to think about in in, in the Netherlands, um, for instance, uh, an NGO like like Waag Society, which is somehow. I think comparable to the EFF in uh, mm. in, in the United States, uh, says that uh, we should build something like uh, a citizen commons uh, uh, system, um, in which the uh, collecting uh, and sharing of data because becomes something that's in the personal interest of people. Um, uh, you talk a lot about smart cities. Um, smart cities need smart citizens. Hello, Ilona. Um, uh, um, and you know, being aware of if I'm able to decide what data I give out, hand out to other people. Uh, um, also, like the Creative Commons, 
uh, system uh, uh, has integrated. You know, I am, I am, I am creating content. I am creating data, but I am the one who decides what I hand out uh, and what I don't hand out. But then you need an ecosystem of um, of uh, developers, of politicians, uh, of informed citizens. Hopefully, a lot of libraries that say, "Yeah, we are doing this together." So we are, for instance, building on a small scale, so not <clears throat> building uh, uh, multi-billion dollar companies, but we are, we are looking at our own city, our own village. We want to, for instance, develop apps or, or uh, 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 data sources that are in our benefit. Because it's, it's not about uh, um, that I'm against sharing data, not at all. Um, I am against collecting data uh, in a way that I don't know uh, that it is happening. Uh, and I don't know where this data ends up. And, uh, uh, and I don't even care that people are making money uh, uh, with that. But it's, it's about being the invisible element of it. So I think libraries should be one of the key players to open up this, this phenomenon, because it's happening. Um, but we should be able to make it, to turn it into something positive. Um, and turning this whole aspect, this whole uh, theme of digital privacy into something positive, into something fun, I think that's the key. Um, because, you know, of course, private things are not something that you want to discuss with the world. Um, <laughs> no, it's, 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 uh, it's something that belongs to you. Um, when you read about uh, these topics in newspapers, watch it on the news, look, look at it online, it's always about the negative aspects of oh, another data leak. Oh, Facebook has done things with your data. Oh, Cambridge Analytica. Oh, fake news. You know, people are, 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 um, are, are somehow educated that this, is, that, that this whole thing of privacy is something that's negative. Um, mm. uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's actually a very valuable, very personal uh, thing. So when we started to think about, OK, what, want, what do we want to do to make this data detox kit something that's fun to use? How do we make people aware? in a fun and engaging way that it, it can actually be nice to talk about your digital privacy. Mm. Um, uh, um, we come up, we, we came up with um, um, this show that I uh, uh, talked about earlier. I just want to show you a short video and maybe then you get an idea of what we yes. turned this abstract thing um into uh, to make it more uh, accessible for for well it was aimed in general uh, at first at elderly people but it turns out that it worked for basically anyone so i want to share a screen again um, let's see are you And now don't don't see my screen. So maybe if I do it my full screen, it could also work. Yep, got it. Sorry. <laughs> En is de meest simpelige manier voor mensen om kennis te maken in eigen digitale persoonlijkheid. Uh, en dan speciaal gericht op digitale privacy. Privacy is niet leuk, uh, het is heel persoonlijk. 
En toen kwamen er eigenlijk automatisch een foto van combinatie. Moet je zoeken of iets dat leuk is, want anders krijgen ze mensen naar je toe. Dan kom je met dat onderwerp privacy. Uh, dus ik haal heel snel uit een spelshow met Chris Brown. Dat je zegt, leuke, nou, glitter en glitter en prijzen ja, kunt combineren met uh, wat mensen kunnen leren in de vorm van Chris Brown. En dat werd ik naar de privacy show van de klant. Maar je weet vast al dat je vaak niet dezelfde wachtwoorden als voor verschillende uh, uh, diensten moet gebruiken. Even appjes, games. Uh, dus ik weet misschien een manier om gemakkelijker om een lang wachtwoord te bedenken. Waarom we deze show hebben gestart en geïnitieerd. Dat heeft te maken met heel veel mensen niet weten wat er online gebeurt. En wat er online met hun gegevens gebeurt. En daarom moeten ze wat meer daarover vertellen. Of voor doelgroepen, 5 plus, maar ook jongeren, uh, zien we dat daar een kwetsbare groep is uh, waar we heel graag meer informatie aan geven. En vraag 1 is als volgt: Hoeveel geld tot nu toe in Nederland verdient met phishing? A. 10.000 euro. B. 100.000 euro. C, 2 miljoen euro. Ja, niet eerder. 2 miljoen? Ja, 2 miljoen is goed. Applaus. Dat is een heel system. Dat is uh, dat je net berichten krijgt. En als je daarom op reageert, dan um, voel je de belasting. Als je daarom op klikt, dan, um, dan moet je geld krijgen. En dan krijg je van de niet. Het is ontzettend belangrijk dat je het kunt leren. De kinderen zijn er elke dag mee kwaad. Ze zitten bijna allemaal op, op Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. En het is belangrijk dat ze wel weten hoe ze met de informatie om moeten gaan. Het gaat dus aangeboden krijgen. Ja. Wat gebeurt hier in het echte leven ook niet? He, dat je iemand tegenkomt op zaterdag, die ken je helemaal niet. Oh, nee. Sander, ik heb een kaartje voor uh, dit. Dan moet je mij even vertellen wat je bang heeft. Ja, zeker. Dat ga ik. Dat, dat. Ja, ik vond het helemaal fantastisch. En zeker voor de jongeren. Uh, het is gewoon op een ludieke manier jongeren bewust worden van, uh, van die van alle dreigingen. Om met contact te zitten. Wacht op de fitting en ook let op je eigen privacy. We hebben alle studenten van Free Support en Roar deze show laten volgen. Omdat we het als ROC Free Support gewoon ontzettend belangrijk vinden dat studenten uh, digitaal weerbaar zijn. Dat ze hun eigen persoonsgegevens op een goede manier kunnen beschermen. Maar straks ook als ze het beroep ingaan, bijvoorbeeld in een zorgberoep of, of in een veiligheidsberoep. Dat ze ook op een goede manier uh, bijvoorbeeld de gegevens van patiënten weten te beschermen. Ja, en dat doe je toch door bijvoorbeeld veilig om te gaan op wachtwoorden of phishing mails te herkennen of onder andere. Ik vond het heel interessant. En uh, ja, ik heb ook wel wat dingen geleerd en dingen werden verteld waarvan ik nog niet wist dat het zo was. Zoals dat je een wachtzin beter is dan een wachtwoord. En er worden ook wel veel mails verstuurd op de dag, phishing mails. Dat wist ik ook niet, dat het zoveel waren. Nou, ik denk wel dat ik hem er beter ga uitkijken. En ik denk ook dat ik uh, Firefox ga installeren in plaats van Safari. Ik vind het heel belangrijk dat je weet wat je doet op het internet. En dat je weet wat er gebeurt met je gegevens als je op Facebook zit. Ik denk alles wat je kennis kunt overdragen op een leuke manier, waardoor je het ook nog aansluit bij de doelgroep. Nou, dan heb je een uh, win-win situatie. I have to say, you did a great job with the bow tie. I want to be really clear about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't fantastic. feel like it. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that, that you said right before in the video, oh, and, and I've, I love this, um, you know, we really are to the point now where one, you know, I like the idea of switching the frame, right? Right now, privacy is a yeah. sort of negative frame. It's, it's when it is exploited. It is when it is hacked. It is when it is copied and and so the idea of switching it to something that we have some power in and a positive light and i'm one of the things i mentioned before we got started that i was um, working on a book and one of the things that i i spent a lot of time on was that actually data our personal data is now literally a currency that when people buy new televisions um the reason they're so cheap right everyone thinks oh well now you know in, in Six years time, it went from $2,000 euros would get me a 
a 50 inch high definition television. And now that money gets me a 70 inch Wi-Fi enabled, you know, 4K, blah, blah, blah. Isn't it great that technology makes things cheaper? But in truth, they're selling you the hardware at a loss because they're collecting data on your viewing habits and watching habits and reselling that to advertisers to different things. Um, refrigerators are now getting the same place. Why do you think they're putting televisions in them so that they, they can sort of turn everything into a data um, collection unit? Yeah. And one, so I mean, quite literally, we are buying televisions with our money and our data. We're buying our phones with our dollars and our data. We're buying, you know, and and that's not explicit. We haven't made that clear. That's what's happening, and yet that is what's happening. That that right now the data industry globally is more valuable than the oil. Well, particularly now, more valuable than the oil industry. And I think that if we began, you know, looking at it as how are you investing your data in the same way we talk about how are you investing your dollars. And, you know, it could really begin to change people's perception because they, one, now get a sense of control, two, they get a sense of value that they have within it, and three, they, they have an incentive for really connecting within it. Just a thought. Yeah. Well, this is, this is of course, also brilliantly written down by uh, Shoshana Zuboff in her um, uh, The Age of Satan's Capitalism uh, book. Uh, um, um, it's it's a bit bit of a hard read, but um, there are some excellent interviews with her uh, online also, in, in which she brilliantly describes how this whole process works, uh, um, how how it was developed, uh, uh, starting with Google, but basically now any online company with a, with a marketing objective uh, uh, is is is. Uh, they, 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 they are in need of, of data, um, uh, and you're, you're exactly right that, that, that it's, you know, it's, it's not only uh, uh, the online companies anymore. It's also, it's also the, 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 uh, the Netflixes of this world and, and uh, uh, home, home appliances and, and uh, you name it. Uh, uh, smart doorbells, uh, right. smart toys. Um, uh, and in that sense, um, the data detox kit and also the, the exhibition that is connected to that, the classroom exhibition, focuses much more on those aspects. Uh, uh, also, for instance, being aware of all the cameras that are around when you when you walk through a through a, through a city, for instance, uh, who owns these cameras? Uh, they can be. Uh, uh, they, they, uh, they can be uh, 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 government uh, cameras, uh, but they, 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 they might be uh, commercial cameras too. Um, where does this data end up? Um, and we all have this um, dystopian vision of countries like China, where, where the government is owning these uh, systems and uh, um, basically, basically um, uh, monitoring uh, citizens all the time and and uh, making decisions based on that. Uh, you didn't behave uh, in a good way, uh, or uh, you know, uh, you walk through a, through, a, through a red light. If you if you do that again, um, um, you won't be able to buy a house. Um, now, well, uh, I think two or three years ago. Uh, when we're all will watching Black Mirror, um, the famed th th uh, TV series, um, uh, which which has this episode of uh, uh, giving likes to uh, uh, um, to fellow people, and if if, if you aren't regarded positively, so pushing uh, uh, on 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 the number of likes, um, um, you are. Uh, out of the game, basically, we were thinking, "Oh, that's a, that's a dystopia," um, but it's 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 moving rapidly, and, and uh, um, you know, um, the same goes for for uh, um, uh, um, 
companies that hand out uh, insurances, for instance. Of course, they are very eager to know about your driving habits or drinking habits or, or uh, 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 sporting habits um, because they, they, they want to make decisions based on that. Um, so, so how can a library uh, prevent uh, our society from going and sort of building tinfoil hats and becoming so paranoid <laughs> that move ahead, right? We, you know, um, we can become, we can either, once again, a false choice. Either you're, you're oblivious, you, you don't pay attention to privacy, you're just whatever it takes, fine. Or you become so paranoid that everyone's watching you in surveillance that you don't, can't do anything. It seems to me that libraries can play a role, and you've shown some examples of that, of highlighting this issue and then empowering people to make some decisions, right? Is that, is, is that the yep. role of sort of privacy coach that we're talking about within libraries? I think that's, that's the only way to achieve something. Um, uh, so making it really small, make this topic small, um, um, that's the reason why we call it the smallest privacy show of the Netherlands. Um, so making making everything small, but the topic uh, particularly, um, and building awareness. This is about building awareness, um, starting with the question: uh, um, Do you value your privacy? Um, um, to which a large number of people still answers, no, I don't really care. But then having the tools in, uh, in place, uh, the, the, the ways to, to discuss uh, um, uh, questions like that in place, um, to make it something that is worthy enough to talk about, um, even with people who don't value their privacy anymore. Um, and of course, that's a hard thing to do. Um, but for instance, when it comes to young people and the way in which libraries work together with schools, um, I think you can, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to win there. Um, especially uh, that, we, uh, that we, we have found out that children are very much aware of their privacy. They really value it, but they don't understand the whole world behind the tools that they are using. Um, so how do you teach something like a concept of surveillance capitalism to young people, uh, which is hard, but I think it's necessary to do that. Um, starting with the question, do you understand why this app is free? Um, you know, it's that, that that's that's the first question, and then you have a conversation. Um, the other way around, um, uh, uh, it works for for elderly people um, who are very privacy aware, who who are often capable of making decisions, but simply don't know that they are in the position to make these choices. Uh, you know, you buy a computer, you have all the software installed. Why, why should you look for other web browsers or other ways to, uh, 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 to send uh, direct, direct messages? Uh, you know, we're all using WhatsApp, uh, but I think privacy, uh, I think libraries should, should, in that case, promote tools like Signal or Telegram or other uh, uh, tools that work exactly the same but are totally privacy friendly. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just an awareness issue. Um, I think the hardest task will be to inform um, illiterate or low literate citizens. Um, uh, you know, the most vulnerable, the, 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 the most vulnerable, vulnerable group, I think, um, that, 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 that that we invite into our lives and, and that we work with, um, you know, it's it, it, it gets really hard. So, so our our task in Friesland right now is to work on some kind of data detox kit for this group of people, 
Um, so uh, uh, right now we are setting up uh, a small uh, research project to find out um, what their most uh, mo mo most most important issues are. So talking with 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 the people uh, uh, directly, but also talking with youth workers, with uh, um, you know uh, experts in that area when when it comes to those target groups, um, and come up with some kind of tool. Um, uh, and it shouldn't be a data detox shit, but because that's too much information, that's mm. that's uh, you know it's too much text. Uh, um, but maybe maybe you know well, I don't know yet. But it's 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 something that that's high on our agenda and that we are working on, and we are we are resolving budget uh, um, to make this a reality. Um, so. Taking something that is developed by 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 the beautiful people in uh, Berlin, um, and then saying how can we adapt this to uh, all these different target groups that are uh, 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 very important for us as a public library. Well, and I, but in I general, not raising awareness. Yeah. Well, what I what I really take away from our conversation today. Um, is that notion that it's not about live the tools that library use um, you know preserving privacy etc it really is engaging in the outreach and activism and advocacy to get people to think about this in their whole life not just what happens when they walk into a building um, one of the areas I'm right now absolutely fascinated with is contract uh, contact tracing that is for the pandemic, someone's sick, let's connect with them, let's see who they talk to and, and really try and figure out where the potential spread is. And we're seeing it happen in some countries, which is completely about once where we started this conversation, right? Here's the name of the person who's there, privacy goes out the window. And I think that librarians have a strong role to play here, not just because of privacy, but because they're linked into their community, they're aware of the community, they can have a, a really in-depth connection with them, they can make sure they're preserving privacy, and they bring a service component, right? If we want people who are sick to stay home, that only works if they can eat, if they have access to, they can pay rent, they have social services. And so having librarians play that role of not just simply tracing where the pandemic goes, but really serving people in high stress conditions so that they feel comfortable, so that they feel well taken care of, and so that we can trace this movie forward. Jaren, I want to just thank you very much for, for the day, and, and just generally thank you because you are one of the people who really pushes this profession forward in terms of thinking about new technologies, new ways to think about librarianship, and new ways to service. Um, it, is, it is absolutely a pleasure to, to know and speak with you today, um, and um, I we're going to, Put this up. We're going to have links um, to these things. I know a lot of people are going to want to rewatch the, the the game show because that was fabulous, um, and I really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. It was a fun thing to do, David. So um, good luck with the next sessions, um, and enjoy your day. All right. Thanks, and, everybody. Uh, um, stay safe and wash your hands. <laughs> thank you. Same to you. Bye. <laughs>